since that moment, uh, since since uh, since year zero, Cambodia's economy has grown just so far, uh, and uh, and now it's uh, officially lower middle income. Uh, and this last, I suppose, the last since two thousand and basically since about two thousand and twelve, it has had phenomenal growth, phenomenal. Uh, and that's before that's before there was huge influx of capital from China. It's, it had already started to take off, and the reason that's happened is because they had political stability. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I'm talking to Dr. Dick D. James Wren, another colleague from the Multipolar Peace Alliance. Dr. Wren holds a PhD in international relations from Australia's Deakin University, and he's a leading Sinologist and ASEAN geopolitical expert. He holds the chair of Belt and Road Capital Partners, a geopolitical risk advisory firm, and among many other things, he's also the external relations advisor to the president of the Royal Academy of Cambodia and dean of its media and policy labs, and also several other things. <laughs> we'll talk about that. In addition, Dr. Wren is running a very successful and highly informative substack under the name Long Mekong and The Chair, on which he regularly published highly insightful articles about politics in Southeast Asia and especially about Cambodia. I recommend checking it out and we'll talk about all of that just now. Dikti, thanks for coming online. Thanks very much, Pascal. It's a, really a great pleasure. And uh, I just want to say thank you very much to you and also to our other friend Warwick Powell for setting up the Multipolar Peace Network. I think that's a great initiative and I'm very, very happy to be part of it. And um, and you're a key pillar of that. And yeah, I, I really admire your show. So it's really an honor to be with you. Thank you very much. And likewise, you know, we just before this discussion here, we were talking about our different outlets and how we are trying to, to inf reinforce each other's uh, work. And yeah, I right. think what you're doing with all of your uh, written publications are quite important because you 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 put out high class, high quality political and economic analysis um, on yeah. China, ASEAN, the Pacific. Um, why is that? Where are you coming from? How do you get all of this knowledge about this region? And where are you right now? Well, you know, the, I suppose, interestingly enough, uh, I spent about eight years living in China and I was studying the Belt and Road. Uh, and so I specifically concentrated on Belt and Road. Uh, and before that, of course, I you know, did a PhD. That, but, but the thing was that that had its, you know, was particularly Asia centric at the very beginning, of course. Uh, and then, you know, as the study expanded, then the BRI expanded, I, I suddenly realized that, you know, we have to look at this more 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 detail and i suppose i've always been interested uh, um, my father gave me a choice actually when i was very young he gave me a choice he said you can either go to church with me on sundays or you can go in my study and choose a book to read but when i come back you have to tell me what it's about but then so his library was just full of political science and biographies and history right so uh strangely enough i think i've kind of turned into him <laughs> but you know with the same the same reading so it's always it's been a lifelong thing that's for sure uh and and now now i use it in the sense of and i just as i shared with you before if you learn something if, then you need to share it uh, not what you're doing what we're doing now is is we're sharing knowledge with people uh and and if you you know if you if you don't share it it's not knowledge and I suppose that's really the the impetus is for me to you know put everything out there, and then you let people decide what they think about it, you know, and, and they can use it or not use it or take it to heart or not. But if you don't publish anything, well, then you don't have a voice, and 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 you haven't created any knowledge for anybody. And where's your uh, interest for China and Southeast Asia coming from? I mean, you're from Australia. Is it is it connected with your with your home country or how can how come that that it, it's Asia that you're focusing on? Yeah, well, um, the truth is that uh, is that I've spent a long time in Asia, um, and and it was a choice, you know, it was a real choice in the sense that I I realized long ago that you know that Asia was going to become the center of the global economy. It it just seemed so obvious to me. Uh, a very long time ago, and so I concentrated all my university studies on China, um, and uh, and I concentrated on public diplomacy. So basically, I, uh, I did my first uh, postgrad degree in pu Chinese public diplomacy, 
Uh, my undergraduate degree had a minor in Chinese uh, and I was looking at Chinese media. And uh, when, you know, when everybody else was writing that it's, you know, it's, you, you, you know, they, they don't, they, they, they block everything, they censor everything. And so then I set about to have a look at Chinese media and because I thought that's going to be a completely different kind of environment, uh, ecosystem. And, and then my PhD was on international relations, but focused on China's external uh, development programs, which is what led me eventually to BRI, right? So, so basically, I've focused all my studies uh, very, very closely to China, and then, of course, ASEAN. Uh, and as I learned more, it's gone out, you know, Central Asia, Middle East, etc. Uh, and I lived, uh, I don't want to bore people with my life story, but I lived for 10 years in Europe. I lived for five years in the United States, and I've lived in a lot of places. Uh, but I've spent the last, I suppose, almost 20 years in Asia, uh, plus two years in Tokyo, a long time ago. So and I'm a very well-traveled professor. You are, you are. And it's funny, like we have very similar um, educational paths. My master's degree was also in um, public policy and then IR uh, as, a, as a PhD. And then that leads you down a certain route, right? So yeah. anyone watching yeah. who's thinking about a PhD, think about it well, because it will, it will <laughs> lead yeah, you in a different direction. But yeah. then what is your observation? So you have you have looked at the way that Northeast and Southeast Asia developed over the last 30, uh, probably 30 years, right? And 40, 40 years, basically. 40 years. I mean, well, really, really since really since the post-World War II era. I, look, even that's not really true. I, I think more, the modernity for Asia really started with the, with the, the you know, the, the, the Americans opening uh, Japan and then it sort of trickled into Korea and then, you know, that colonization sort of progress. Uh, but basically what happened was, of course, that uh, people started looking at, J at Japan because it wasn't colonized. And so the Chinese looked at that as a model and they and they started thinking about what the Japanese were doing. And that became the, the, the sort of the key model in Japan in the, in the, very, in the eight, 1890s. So modernization in Asia started basically in the 1890s, I would say. And, uh, and they were already thinking about, you know, getting out of col colonial uh, uh, yoke. Um, they were, you know, definitely thinking about that. So that's when it all started. But it, it really broke free, if you like, once the post-colonial period, post-World War II and then post-colonial period. Um, then, then, you know, it, all, the, all the intellectual power and the... Um, and the and the, cult, the 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 civilizational, the historical, all of that cultural, all became you know became open, more free, and so they've they've advanced very quickly. But I will say that the you know the Americans financed uh, industrialization in Japan, uh, uh, you know during the Korean after World War Two, and then you know into the Korean War, and then they funded Korean industrialization for the Vietnam War, and now they're trying to fund Vietnamese industrialization for what? <laughs> so, no, I mean, the the point is that um, that Asia's uh, modernization didn't really just happen in 40 years. What what did happen in the last 40 years is, is that it, it became part of the global uh, system, you know, a, a power within the economic global system, which had been completely dominated by Europe and the United States. And then Asia just started to become an active market and an active producer uh, of componentry, basically, and other products. Uh, and, and so that's why it really started to take off. Uh, yeah, no. And then, yeah. No, you're, 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 you're absolutely right. Of course, the modernization of, of Asia and so on is going way, way further back. And, you know, if you go further back, then it was Asia that was leading the pack. And that was the that was sure. that was the forefront, right? The one so eighteen forty. You know what? Up to eighteen forty, China was the world's largest economy up until eighteen forty. Still, uh, and it was the Opium War that kind of killed that. Yeah, and you know the one thing that 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 fascinates me is again the 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 ignorance of the Europeans, and I'm I'm sorry that I'm always coming back to that, but it it just fascinates me because. The Europeans know every minute detail about the, the Roman Empire, you know, uh, Julius Caesar, who killed who, where they went and what they what they did and whatnot, uh, because they're such a huge empire. And nobody has even like a faint clue of what the Mongols did and how the Mongols basically ruled over like basically almost all of Eurasia. And that is just gone. And that only 800 years ago. And the, yeah, the Roman right. Empire is 2,500 years ago. And 
this is just so such a such a such a focus. And then, but then, the the fact also that this is one land mass, right? And it's yeah. actually quite interesting. You can you can Google that. You can you can find walking instruction on Google Maps how to walk from Phnom Penh all the way to Portugal Porto. Um, <laughs> this is all walkable. The longest distance I found is to Singapore because it has a bridge. <laughs> But uh, this is not in our mental image <laughs> that this is actually connected. We, we keep thinking of these as two continents. Why? Yeah. It's the only landmass that we think of as in two continents. Yeah, well, you know, distance and time, right? That's always been true. And uh, that's been squashed a lot by, you know, by the internet and by airplanes, train, plane travel in a real sense. I suppose that's true. But education, you know, the, the education system still... You know, people. You know, I. You know, I did China studies, and so did you. And uh, but how many of us were there in university? You know, not not a big number. You know, not a big number in any way. And uh, and so in education, you know, even here in Cambodia, I had students last week, and I and I was asking them about. You know, did they did they know why the why of South Vietnam had the south of the river? You know, why the river goes to the to the estuary in Vietnam. And uh, do you know why? And they were like, no. And I was like, well, did you know that that used to belong to the Khmer Empire? That was belonged to Cambodia and the whole river all the way from the mountain to the sea. And and they were like, really? Is that true? And I was like, yeah, it's true. And and I think, Did, didn't you learn that in school? And they were like, no, we didn't learn that. <laughs> so so it's you know, Cambodian students. Yeah, they were Cambodian students. So, you know, and I, you know, look, and famously, everybody says this, Americans don't know anything about foreign history or even their own. Uh, but I think that's pretty true, pretty well everywhere, actually, uh, that uh, the education system and, and American, Australian, you know, Anglo-American education systems uh, have reduced focus on area studies and on history and humanities. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's very hard to look at anything in context if you don't have a historic timeline or any kind of a timeline, right? Everything's over time. So, yeah, how do you contextualize any piece of information if you don't have it over time? So that's a big mistake in most education systems. And uh, yeah, that historical perspective, it colors everything and the way we think about the world. So, yeah, that's why Europeans become, you know, they say, oh, they have no idea that, you know, they talk about Roman armies, right? And there's, you know, 100,000 men with, you know, Trajan took 100,000 men to 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 Romania, Dacia. Uh, and then at the same time, you know, you've got armies in India and China that were 200, half a million, much, much bigger. And I mean, like, really, is that possible? You know, and uh, and yeah, they were. And it's not, of course, it's, this is, none of this is taught in schools and education systems anywhere else. Uh, and uh, that, that's, I think half of it is just sort of, oh, they don't really need to know this stuff. They just need to have a general idea of history and then let's just focus on our own history. And I think that's okay, but I think it should be contextualized more and that would really help people to understand the world that they're living in and, the, and all of the, you know, the tensions that they hear about every day on television. Yeah, contextualize things. I mean, that's yeah. the study. Yeah. The study of international relations is often just about creating context in order to understand better why certain groups of people move in one direction or another. Causality. Interesting. Hmm? Causality. I mean, uh, you know, I'm always asking people, do you know, you know, what's the cause? Where's this coming from? Where did it start? Uh, you know, because everybody's just looking at things in sort of just one little tiny time frame, which is basically whatever they're receiving now, you know. And then, yeah, there's no contextualization of that. So how to determine whether something's, you know, and then, and then apply a moral value, like good and bad, for example. You know, it's that whole idea about the Ukraine-Russia war, you know, and it started in 2022. It's, ab it's, ab it's absolutely dumb. And I keep saying, you know, evil is not an analytical category. It's the opposite. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. it's the re rejection. It's the refusal of using your brain to understand why somebody did something. Yeah, I think, you know, that, <laughs> that's, why, that's why academics get into so much trouble, because we do use our brains all the time. Uh, but anyway... When, when we do. But um, let me ask you more about um, your experience also and, and your views on the development of uh, Southeast Asia and the Pacific. The Cambodia, you, you're there, is developing quite a lot at the moment, yeah. right? And a lot of the, the non-insular uh, uh, parts of, of Southeast Asia are actually going through a boom. Malaysia too, um, chips and yeah. so on. Productions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, We're in the middle of a, a boom, yeah, a constant boom. It hasn't stopped for the decade. 
Um, Cambodia's had 7.7%, I think it's 7.6 maybe, uh, annualized growth for 10 years. So, and you know, you take COVID out of that and it's better. <laughs> so uh, growth is phenomenal. Um, uh, you know, India's doing 8% this year or something like that. China's doing 5%. Um, uh, Vietnam's still doing five percent, something. Malaysia's doing six. Malaysia's going a doing a great little boom. Uh, Thailand is struggling a little bit. The Philippines is an underperformer. Yeah, it but always it always underperforms. I, you know, it's something to do with the system that they have. Um, and we we can see that with you know what's going on with China, right? Um, they they are they are more vulnerable to external influence and I, I that I think that has a negative effect on their economy they under all the time the Philippines tends to be very unlucky at strategic moments like time and again they they, they were almost almost the first independent Southeast Asian nation in 1899 and then the Americans took over the baton from the from the Spanish and beat that down and yeah. it is re repeated several times and it, it always cuts down the economy. Um, yeah. in one way or another but so what is it about Cambodia right now that's driving the um, the growth so you know the Hun Sen is you know it's just so demonized in western media uh, but then nobody you know very few people really know anything about him uh, and I was very lucky to be asked to edit I was the English editor of his official biography Uh, um, and because somebody had asked me, I don't know, I th you know, when I first came to Cambodia, somebody asked me, so, well, you know, if you go to Cambodia and you have to stay there for a whole long, you know, because of COVID, what, what would be the one thing you'd want to try and achieve? And I said, I think I'd probably want to do a really good biography of Hun Sen. I think he's a really underestimated uh, leader. And, uh, and they were like, oh, yeah, no, that guy, he's a monster. He's a dictator, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and, and I said, no, I, 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 I'm looking at the trajectory over time of Cambodia and, and that 40 years, right? 19, well, sorry, 30 years. He's been in power basically for about 38 years. Uh, I, I won't say the first eight was really full power uh, because the, you know, for, you know, setting up a, you know, it was post-conflict, post-Khmer Rouge and all that sort of stuff. But in a very easy framework, uh, Khmer Rouge, at the end of Khmer Rouge, that's what, what they call the year zero. I mean, basically, there was four doctors in the whole country. Yeah, uh, after, after the genocide, it was 25% of the population that were massacred, yeah, right? Yeah. It's like in, yeah. unimaginable. Well, no, 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 the, no, no. The, the, the genocide thing is a, it, it, that's not actually true. I mean, it's not as if two million people were kind of taken into camp, concentration camps like in, in Nazi Germany at the end of the war and then all just exterminated. It wasn't like that. Uh, it uh, Basically, uh, it was a combination of effects and policies that were introduced. And then there's the sort of the manic, psychopathic, sociopathic role that was, you know, that some of the leaders and some of the, you know, those very low end people um, <clears throat> and they just became monsters. But, so how uh, many, like in terms of the the, the about two million died? people, one one point seven to two million. Nobody's exactly sure who died or who yeah, were died, died. But uh, the the you know the the very largest number died from disease and famine. And yeah. famine in a country that produces literally the best or one of the best rices in the world. I mean, everywhere there's a lot of rice, but. I mean, literally, I think there's a there's a competition for every year for you know the best rice in the world. It's you know conducted in China or in in, in Italy or somewhere, and uh, Cambodia's won that five years in a row or four years out of five as the best rice. I mean, the rice here is fantastic, really, really high quality, uh, and there's no shortage of it. But uh, and it's now a major export. But uh, under the Khmer Rouge, what they did was they basically took everybody out of the cities and made them go in the rice fields to produce more rice to make more money. Right. But in doing that, of course, the economy collapsed uh, and then actually it ended up uh, that sort of collectivist kind of idea. And they ended up producing less uh, rice and uh, and people starved and lived in the forests and all sorts of things and disease. And but uh, but directly killed in con in camps and in, uh, you know, torture and all that stuff. Oh, yeah, it's just terrible. But but that was not two million people. And. And, and uh, it, it, it's wrong to say that the Khmer Rouge actually set out to kill two million people. They did it. Uh, it but it was definitely uh, as a result of their policies and their actions and then the fact that they turned into psychopathic 
maniacs, megalomaniacs. That, that, that's definitely true. But anyway, all of that to say that since that moment, uh, since, since, uh, since year zero, Cambodia's economy has grown just so far. Uh, and, uh, and now it's uh, officially lower middle income. Uh, and this last, I suppose the last, since 2000, and basically since about 2012, it has had phenomenal growth, phenomenal. Uh, and that's before, that's before there was huge influx of capital from China. It's, it had already started to take off. And the reason that's happened is because they had political stability. And, uh, you know, it, uh, as you I, you pointed out to me, I didn't realize that it was Sihanouk, uh, the King Sihanouk, uh, back, you know, he, he brought uh, Cambodia into independence in the 50s. Uh, and they had a sort of a golden age of cinema and music and all that sort of stuff during that period. Uh, and the economy kind of took off. Um, but um, uh, he wrote an, a, an article, you said, uh, for foreign affairs on neutrality, right? Well, so that's still the uh, actual official policy of Cambodia is neutrality. And, and what, it, what drew me to Hun Sen was that he'd actually been able to keep this balance between uh, the Americans, the Europeans, the Chinese and ASEAN. And he's managed to do that successfully for 30 years. Uh, you know, it's been a bit up and down and it's been a bit difficult here and there. Uh, let's say in 2014, for example, the, you know, the Americans almost got him thrown out. Um, you know, they financed and organized the color revolution um, in 2014. Uh, but I think that actually scared the government into, into thinking, okay, we really need to start thinking about what we're doing here and, uh, and, and be far more concentrated on, on the development of, of you know, people-centric kind of system. And then the Chinese at, uh, at that period just also started uh, investing into, into in, you know, Belt and Road, for example. And uh, so Cambodia is on that wave. And um, it's, they've, been, they've been, because it's so politically stable, they've been able to, to integrate all of this properly. Now, when you come from, say, Europe or America or somewhere, it still looks like they haven't got it organised, but it is. It's really very well organised. Uh, and so they're phenomenal growth. And it's look at the way it's going. It's going to hit middle income by 2030, and uh, that's that's just phenomenal. Really, that's a, a really great performance, uh, and that's because uh, they've had political stability under Hun Sen. Uh, yes, it's basically a single party that dominates, and yes, it's a centralized government. But remember, it's a very small country. It's uh, only 16 million people, and they had year zero 30 years ago. So, I think that's functioned for them very well. Uh, and now they've uh, they've they've done the impossible, and that is they had an extraordinarily smooth transition a year ago. They had an election, fair fair election, um, worked really well, and and uh, he he got his son in as prime minister, and the the and the CPP and the royalists joined together, and and uh, they did a smooth operation, a smooth transition. And now they've got all young technocrats. So that first kind of revolutionary post-Khmer group, they're all in their 70s, maybe even 80s. That group is now kind of taking the emeritus role, sitting back. Uh, and the technocrats, they've all been foreign trained, China, Russia, the US, Australia, UK, Europe, France, Germany, wherever, uh, from all over. Um, they are now running everything, all the ministries, uh, all of that. And they're doing a really good job. And then the other thing uh, to say is that the economics of the economy, the deputy prime minister and the economics department, the uh, ministry, they have been very responsible. So it's got really great fiscal and monetary policy pegged to the dollar. Um, and they've got good gold reserves and good dollar reserves. And uh, so when the pandemic hit, uh, Cambodia was the second country in the world after the United Arab Emirates to hit its pre-pandemic GDP, second in the world. That's phenomenal performance. Uh, and everybody had been fully vaccinated. I mean, 90% of the population was vaccinated within three months. And three how, months. Um, how, how is it, how's the diplomacy going? So um, Really good, really, does, really How's fine. the connection with Vietnam and with China? Because, I mean, Vietnam intervened in Cambodia and then China intervened in, in Vietnam. And how is that, how's yeah. that now? That, that's Yeah, well, so that's, that's, so that's that thing about that, that young student who didn't know about Cambodian history, right? So basically it was the French that, that um, cut the Khmer Empire in half and they took the bottom half 
and the river and the coastline. And they took that away from Cambodia and they gave it to Vietnam or, you know, sort of in an administrative area, right? So that's why Vietnam's that really long sort of crocodile shape. And, uh, and, and, and so people think, oh, you know, that's Vietnam. But actually, Vietnam never existed like this until the French created that. Uh, and so there was a Khmer Empire and and that Khmer Empire was always sort of, you know, in a sort of a very, I won't say tribal, but I, I will say sort of ethnic group, large, large ethnic group, um, always, in, you know, always struggling with the Thais and always struggling with the Viet and always struggling with other groups like that. So, but the, the big two were, were the Viet. Uh, there, there was a, another little empire called the Champa. Uh, but that's that kind of disappeared. Um, there was there's just a little bit left of it. If you go to Vietnam, you can still see pieces or remnants of that. Uh, but so it was always, you know, Cambodia now is kind of between the Vietnamese crocodile and the and the the Thai tiger. Uh, and and so Laos is considered sort of you know maybe as a more friendly, maybe a rabbit or something. You know, very very friendly. Um, and so that's how it sort of sees itself. And, and, and so that's it, it's it's politics is like that. So the balance is, you know, to keep those two middle powers happy, uh, not upset them, but at the same time, not, not let them take advantage uh, or, you know, over sovereignty, which they've tried to do. The Vietnamese have tried to take uh, some sovereignty from the, the, the Cambodians um, in one way or the other. And the Thais have also done that. But I would say that in the last, at least in the last 15 years, most of that's just stopped. Uh, and China has been the, the largest stabilizing force in that arrangement, and ASEAN is the other stabilizing force in that arrangement. Uh, and, and I think that's what gives the whole region its strength, is that they've, that they've got that uh, ASEAN block stabilizing, stabilizes the whole, the whole of the Southeast Asia, that's for sure. And, and, and in real terms, uh, Japan, Korea, China is also stable, um uh, let's say status quo stable uh but their economy so china's economy definitely is stable uh the japan i'm not so sure about but korea is sort of okay um and so cambodia is benefiting benefiting from all of that and uh, and so now it's become a central hub right it's now a hub a node between the middle powers of thailand and vietnam and to the much larger ones you know korea and japan and china and indonesia for example or even the, you know the networks to india are starting to grow again and i think that's fantastic and so cambodia has got this really prime that's why i was saying it's a little bit like switzerland yeah it uh it, it is it now is kind of makes itself like if if something wants to travel from thailand to vietnam from a car factory or component factory or electronics, it's basically going to go through Cambodia. And, and Cambodia uh, is also an integral part of the Belt and Road Initiative, right? Of the connection, right. isn't it? And yeah. this this then turns out to be quite beneficial to them because like sometimes people say like, oh, landlocked countries, they cannot, they don't have well, free access. Cambodia is not yeah. landlocked. It has a coastline onto the Gulf of Thailand. Sorry, yes. I think yes. That's really important, yeah. Well, that's one, that's got to be the one thing that the Americans are not really happy about you know i mean you know the, the american idea of course is you know all of asia should be a transmission belt for you know countering china okay basically but um but there's a naval base so cnookville is has a history it's a it's the biggest port in cambodia and it's on the gulf of thailand and it gives access to the south of the south china sea and so the americans don't like that there's a that there's a naval base right next to a port. Now, anybody who knows anything about maritime, there's always a naval base next to the big port. Of course, that's what you need. You've got to be able to protect your own trade uh, and your own ports. So there's always a naval base next to a large port. Uh, but anyway, this naval base, of course, was, uh, uh, was an entry point during the Vietnam War for the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And so, yeah, so the Russians and the Chinese would put stuff into there and other people, whoever, you know, uh, would put it into Sinukville and then it would literally carried on people's backs all the way up through Cambodia into the south or even further up into the north or through Laos into the north. And so that's the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And, um, and of course, that's what Nixon and, uh, and Kissinger bombed the hell out of, right, and, and created the Khmer Rouge by doing that. But um, 
Uh, so that scene will feel sort of dark history for the Americans. And, and so they still re they still don't like it. And, uh, uh, because that's now growing, Seanogville's growing, the Cambodia's economy is growing. It makes sense that they need a, a better port, a naval port next to their major trade port. And so they've expanded that, but it's not big in any real scale. I mean, but this naval port is, is under complete control of Cambodia, right? It's not, yeah, it's our, yeah, well, it's not being out in parts to China no, or the no, Americans no, no, or something. No. So why would the Americans not be happy about that? Why why would there be any dispute about that? I mean, isn't it the no, most normal thing in the world to have a naval port? Uh, the Americans had been there. They they'd made an arrangement to be able to have a staging, like a very small staging area at the port at the naval base, uh, where they kept some equipment or whatever, and, and that was there. Um, but they basically tried to strong arm the government into letting them put in ships, you know, uh, naval ships you know destroyers of frigates or something uh you know larger ones and 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 the government said no we can't do that uh and i and i look there was pressure from uh from all of their neighbors you know basically from asia and generally said well this is not a good idea and the chinese said they don't like it either so uh so cambodia said well look no you can't have it and the americans got upset put on sanctions, of course, and some tariffs on their garment exports. And the US remains the largest export market for Cambodia. Uh, so, you know, number one. Number two is Europe and number three is China. Uh, so that's a nice balance, actually. Uh, and so uh, so the government said, well, hang on, no, you can't strong arm us like this and then sanction us as well. OK, so forget that. So they 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 knocked down the supply depot that the Americans had built and they let the Chinese build one. You have now Southeast Asia now has choices. That's the thing. Yeah. This is yeah, the, the point new, is they this, have choices. That's right. This was new about multipolarity. If the yeah. Americans try to be to to be nasty to you, you can ask the others. Of course, you have to be careful with what you offer to them. Yeah, because, sure. Yeah. Uh, but I'm pretty sure like a, a, a Cambodia understands this game pretty well, having been also between its other neighbors, right? And, and it understands neutrality. It understands the balance, right? And it, 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 at this point in time. The balance is that the, the Chinese are going to help pay for the for the the, the actual trading port and expand that and everything else, and so they have a real interest in also being able to have the regular military patrols of the Gulf of Thailand and making sure the ports uh, are secure. And I suppose it seems very normal. These are very small ships. I mean, we're not talking big ships here. We're talking, you know, like thirty meter, forty meter boats. You know, they're not big. Uh, Cambodia and Laos are sometimes criticized for being ASEAN's most um, most um, co co the, the, the states that cooperate with China the most and sometimes repay with diplomatic favors inside the ASEAN Quorum. Um, well, what do you make that. out I mean, of that? Well, that's a label, isn't it? I mean, uh, it a diplomatic favor, I mean, really? Uh, maybe they actually agree with it. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, I, that, like, for example, I think it was at Cambodia, basically, because, you know, ASEAN's consensus driven. Everybody yes. has to agree. Yes. yes. And so what? So if you don't agree, now you're evil. I mean, that's not how consensus-driven organizations work. It's you, you have a choice and you exercise it uh, for whatever reason, if you think it's in your interest to do so. And you can't be punished for that. Uh, so that's how consensus is driven. Uh, everybody has to come to some kind of an agreement. And, and, and that's the art of diplomacy. I mean, that's what diplomacy is all about. Uh, it's not about just telling people what to do. That's not, that's not diplomacy. Uh, and of course, that's that's the problem with uh, that is the problem with the American approach. Of course, is always that it's just a little bit too strong arm, uh, and it's not appreciated. They they don't really approach the reason with any subtlety in that way. Um, so yeah, uh, Laos also. Well, look, Laos is landlocked, and Laos is one is still very poor. Uh, it's now exporting electricity, which is really interesting. So, uh, and it's the Vietnamese and the Thais that have built most of the dams and and run the electricity out of there. So it's it's not actually the Chinese. Uh, the, uh, the Chinese built two of the dams, I think, but uh, the rest is funded by Thailand and 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 by Vietnam because they need it. So uh, there's a lot of myths about that as well. And the same as in Cambodia, actually, only two of the dams in Cambodia were built by Chinese. Uh, and, and the others were built by the Cambodians themselves or even, even through World Bank or whatever. 
So um, is it fair to say that right now ASEAN is also, uh, you know, the, the, the different ASEAN members are helping each other right now in growing their economies? The, the, because we don't absolutely. have an ASEAN free trade agreement, right? But we have a lot of different, different well, arrangements for call. There's the RCEP. No, no. So there's a tariff free. There's a whole sort of, yeah, I can't tell you exactly what it is. I've read it many times, but I don't remember it too, you know, completely. But but basically, you're operating in a tariff fee zone okay. in, in, inside ASEAN. And that's been extended, RCEP, to Australia and New Zealand and Korea and Japan and China. So, you know, that that's a really big trading block, RCEP. And I, in my mind, the question is, you know, it's really an extension of ASEAN. Okay, so... I mean, for me, ASEAN is the most successful block. I mean, it's it's not had any wars since it was set up. There's been no conflict, uh, despite great power competition. There's been no internal conflict except for what's going on in Myanmar right now, but that's internal conflict. Uh, but there is external forces at work. But um, and maybe we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, but yeah, ASEAN is definitely, you know, integration is their main and key priority is integration, integration of digital systems of power grids, pipelines, you know, the whole thing, anything that's connectivity, right? So roads, rail, ports, electricity, pipelines, internet, uh, and then all of the digital services that go on top of that, right? So that's all substructure, right? All physical hard stuff. And then you've got the superstructure, all the cross-border trade, local currency transactions, um, you know, cross-border customs, automatic clearance, all of those things are coming online. That's all being done right now. And some of it's already active. So for example, between Malaysia and Singapore. And uh, so I think Malaysia is quite advanced in this way. Um, Cambodia and Laos, Vietnam and Myanmar, a little bit behind, uh, but uh, LVM, uh, uh, what is it? LVCM. Uh, but uh, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, they're, they're kind of pulling it along. And we have to remember that Indonesia is the driving force, right? So ASEAN without Indonesia, mm, maybe not. <laughs> Uh, because, yeah, no, uh, uh, because there's a definite split between the maritime and the continental kind of ASEAN, right? right. And the Americans are definitely trying to make take advantage of that. Whereas, yeah, the, the, yeah they're trying to split the maritime from the continental uh, because, you know, they can send ships, right? Uh, but they can't, put, they can't land troops, so they can send ships. So that's their kind of, you know, modus operandi everywhere, actually. But, uh, uh, but yeah, Indonesia is the real, the thing that holds it all together uh, at the end of the day. But look, all the ASEAN economies are performing really well, except for the Philippines. Mm. You know, uh, yeah, Laos. Um, Vietnam also is having a little bit of a downturn, but this is demand driven because if, if your economy is dependent and the ASEAN economy is dependent on the European market or the American market, there's been a definite downturn, a definite demand in decrease. That's for sure. And, and everybody knows that the demand for the future is all in Asia. And so that's everybody switching. The trend is definitely toward BRICS, BRICS Plus, Belt and Road, all of that sort of thing, with a kind of a fondness for things European still, for some strange reason, and even some people for America as well. Why not? Culturally, especially. But um, uh, the demand definitely, and all, all of the governments now, and I think you can especially see this with the, the Malaysians, you know, Lavrov was just there and the, and the Malaysians are going to try and join BRICS. I mean, this is fantastic. And, uh, and so the Cambodia, Malaysia and Thailand are working quite closely together these days. And I think that has a lot to do with the Gulf of Thailand and also because that, they're trying to, that triangulation uh, create a sort of dynamic triangle and then also exert pressure into Myanmar to try and get this five point peace plan working. Let's talk about this for a moment because Myanmar is going through an internal conflict, a, a civil war, which is very complex. I did I did a talk with a, with a Thai scholar the other day. It's like a lot of factions in a lot of places. It boils down to this military coup that happened in 2021, uh, basically mm -hmm. a counter a counter reaction to what happened in 2011 when 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 uh, Myanmar opened and actually developed uh, quite a bit um, yeah. you in Cambodia where do you see that conflict at the moment um so that's something that I'm looking at very closely right now actually and uh, I'm 
I'm probably going to go to Myanmar in the very near future. But uh, uh, I've been studying that quite closely. So, yeah, as you just said, there's so many different sort of ethnic, religious, factional, uh, and they all have sort of different agendas and... Uh, if 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 any if you've done sort of uh, any kind of early twentieth century Chinese studies in the you know the warlord period, oh. um, which gave rise to the nationalists, you know, uh, power, uh, and so some of these warlords have agreements with the central government, and some of them have agreements with uh, say China or with India or somebody else or another warlord, and 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 they then they can switch sides depending on what their interests are. So it, it's. Uh, Basically, they're just running little fiefdoms, and uh, that's mostly what most of this is about. And the real conflict is basically east and west. So the north, up near India, that's fairly stable because the Indians need it to be stable because Assam uh, has always been a trouble, uh, a trouble uh, sort of rebellious province, uh, and there's a there's a lot of a lot of strife still going on in in Assam. So the Indians definitely want to keep that under control. Uh, Bangladesh also wants to keep its border under control, and uh, especially because of the Rohingya, who originally came from the Bengal, right? What was then Bengal, not 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 Bangladesh, um, but they're Muslims. Uh, and then on the Chinese border as well, it's a relatively quite stable until you get down to Laos and Thailand. Uh, and so the Lao border is fairly loose, but. But because it's very close to China and then it's got Vietnam on the other side, um, I think the Lao border is not so porous because, you know, it's landlocked. So how do you get weapons and drugs in and out? Money, weapons, drugs. And so then, you know, basically uh, the money and the guns uh, and the drugs go through Thailand. Mm -hmm. And I'd say the, the vast majority. So people say the Golden Triangle, but really that one side of the golden triangle is thailand and that's pretty well where most of the action is happening there was a report from i, I can't remember i think it was from the un um rapporteur on 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 myanmar who <laughs> who wrote that uh, there was 176 million dollars worth of guns had been uh, exported or through thailand into myanmar right now but then you know, in the sort of uh, the seventh paragraph or something, he said, oh, but the, the Thai government had nothing to do with it. Okay, so, yeah, but you don't, you can't move $176 million worth of guns through somewhere without somebody knowing about it. So, uh, you know. This, it's this also, is... it's, it's a hot spot there. So I have one contact in Chiang Mai, and he tells me that A, as a, you can see it in the hospitals where more and more people are from that region are then being treated, they're being brought over the border. And B, you can see it in, in the size of the American consulate in Chiang Mai, which is humongous. Humongous. And there's only one reason for that, which is massive spying and clandestine sure. operations. Yeah, there's no and doubt about that. Because you, have, yeah. you have direct access to this, to this area, right? And it concentrates around there. And because it is forests and so on, it's easy to traverse. There, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Chiang Rai and Chiang Mai, uh, yeah. the two the two areas, and you've got two uh, Thai military groups. I, I, I can't remember. I think it's the Third Army and the Seventh Army, and uh, I've read reports, lots of you know public reports, just stating that basically those are run like fiefdoms, and so the the the, the central army headquarters in in Bangkok knows or has a good inkling of what's going in and what's going out. Uh, at any given moment, uh, but they're not really telling the civilian government in, in, in Thailand what's going on. But what, and this goes back to your question earlier about what's Cambodia doing about this. And, and so uh, Hun Sen has been very active with, you know, the return of Thaksin Shinawat to yeah. Thailand. So Hun Sen and Thaksin Shinawat have always had a, quite a good relationship. So they've touched base again. Uh, and then the new prime minister is also friendly with Thaksin Shinawat. So that's, that Thai-Cambodia relationship is sort of strengthened. And then Anwar Ibrahim in Malaysia is also part of that grouping. So now there's that triangulation. And so um, now that uh, Hun Sen has, doesn't have to worry about the day-to-day -day running of Cambodia any longer, 
uh, he's got time to sort of play elder statesman and he's pretty good at this. I mean, he's been doing it all his life, uh, you know, setting up peace deals and going, you know, Paris Peace Accords, UN and all that. He, know, he knows how to do this stuff. And so he is basically driving this uh, very quietly, uh, driving this triangulation between Myanmar, Thailand and Cambodia to try and calm the Myanmar situation down. But this means that Thailand is basically in some way going to have to put controls on their border. Uh, but you see, the problem with this is, if that happens, um, then, uh, then the rebels won't have access to weapons. It's because the government buys their weapons from India and from China and from Russia. And the rebels buy all their weapons from the Americans or the Koreans or Japanese. So, or, uh, so, so, and they, and those weapons, of course, are illegally shipped in, right? They have to be. So, so, and then there's drugs shipped out and there's, you know, very, very large amount of drugs being shipped out. And every now and then they'll say, oh, we caught this, we've got this huge methamphetamine haul, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, where do those drugs go? Where are they going? Uh, you know, one has to ask that question. Now, I, you know, I, I'm not going to, I don't want to follow the drug trade. It really, might be too dangerous. But I do know, and I think most people know, the fame of the Golden Triangle was about when the nationalist forces in the post-communist revolution, China, 1949, they couldn't, they were in Chengdu and they couldn't get to Taiwan. So they went into Myanmar and they were never able to leave. They stayed there. And that's that whole story about the, the Golden Triangle and the drug running and everything. It was all set up by these nationalist forces uh, because the only way they could afford to uh, keep their army supplied was to sell drugs. And, and they did. And they sold them. Of course, they sold them to American soldiers in Vietnam and Thailand. That's, that's you know, well it, 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 it just shows how geography is destiny. I mean, what you can do on the actual ground with what you've got available with rivers and forests and ports and so on. Yeah determines kind of how things move, which is why uh, probably um, st whatever the, the, the development is going to be in Myanmar, it's going to have to do something with the geostrategic situation of where these different forces at the moment are. And, and the thing at the moment is they're locked in, right? I mean, nobody has the power to win over, over everybody. So it is a, a pretty... Yeah, nobody, nobody has the power to win over everybody. That's true. So, so basically, the northern Indian border is stable. The northern Chinese border is stable. The southern Chinese border on the Golden Triangle is less so. There's still a lot of activity going on there, you know, casinos and, you know, all sorts of stuff. But, you know, the, I think the Chinese are fairly strict on this. Uh, you know, there were cyber scams and all sorts of stuff going on there, but they arrested a lot of people. Um, I don't know, 250 people were arrested not long ago. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the Thai side is the side that's worrying. And of course, the Rohingya side. And of course, they're trying to push them out. So, so, but that's not, the, that's not the junta that's doing that. It's not the central government, military government that's doing that. That's the Arakeen army that's doing that. And they're, are they in some kind of you know, arrangement with the other parties, the central government and other warlords? Yes. Yes, they are. And they are because they're on the ground, they've got the guns and, you know, nobody could actually defeat them, you know, under present circumstances. So that's sort of the eastern side. And then on the western side, uh, there's also the Shan, the northern Shan. They're also kind of fighting. But you have to remember that they've been fighting for ever since the British left. Yeah. You know, 80 years ago. So in terms of like historical examples, what kind of solution mechanism do you think is the most realistic one to bring about, I don't know, an, a government of national reconciliation or anything like that, that would, that would re-stabilize most, the biggest part of, of Myanmar? Well, I'm going to go with Thomas Hobbes on this one. I'm not a realist, but I'm going to go with Thomas Hobbes on the, the idea that uh, the absence of interference is proof of freedom. Mm. Uh, and, and so the first thing that has to happen has, has, there has to be there has to be an absence of interference. I mean, you know the, the supply of weapons into the country <clears throat> uh, and the supply of training and direction and all that sort of stuff, that's all external forces. That has to stop. Otherwise, otherwise there's no hope at all. Uh, other than that, um, the look, the central government, at some point, it's 
it's majority Burmese. They're sixty percent of the population, and they control the river valleys. And you know, there's a lot of water in Myanmar, and they control all of that, and they still control all of that. So that's their strength. They've got basically control of the navigation, the transport, and the food production, and most, uh, but not not mining and stuff like that. That's that's dispersed. But definitely the transport, the food, things like that, uh, main highway routes, east, west, north, south, that they control most of that. They still control most of that. And it's the east side and the western side with the Rohingyas and then up in the Shan, up in the mountains and the drugs and the jade and the and the emeralds and the gold, all that sort of stuff. And and so, yeah, that's warlords and they've been like that for forever. Um, and uh, so people ask me, you know, why is it a military unit? And it's like, well, because the center is always fighting a war against the periphery. Uh, all these ethnic groups, I don't know how many there are, but there's, right. you know, it's a very big. But the thing is, there's a lot of Burmese who are also very unhappy about this. I mean, even in the center, like the, the political allegiances do not necessarily go by ethnicity, do they? It's, I have a lot of, I have a couple of I, Myanmari I, I, friends who tell me that majority, the they majority. want this thing gone, this junta that is, that is destroying all of their uh, economic opportunities now in the center. Uh, but I wouldn't. I, I, well, look, the World Bank just released a, released their economic report on Myanmar just like a few, like a couple of weeks ago, and Myanmar's got almost one percent economic growth. Hmm. Uh, so look, the, cent the, the 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 central government. I mean, it's not as if they the, the bureaucracy is still in place. I mean, it's not as if they don't know how to run the country. It's not as if they don't know how to build roads or build schools and employ people and do. They they know how to do that. The problem is that they're always confronted with all these forces that are that are coalescing and then being broken up and then re-coalescing and then being funded and trained by other people, or they've only ever done that. Uh, and, and all they want to do is get access to resources that they can sell so they can buy more guns. Um, look, I, the majority of the Burmese population, and I don't know how large a majority, I, I, it's probably, as you say, it's probably a small majority, but uh, still support the central government. And because they, those people, and, and I have friends that go there all the time, and they, I've got a friend who runs a winery. They make wine. And, and really yeah, good. No, the, the, it's, it's, it's working, but yet if I listen to the stories of my friend from Mendeley, then he, the, it's pretty clear that they would wish to, to return to the to the previous deal of the of the ten years in which like there was really quite a phenomenal uh, yeah, well, money uh, was coming in and they were the the sanctions were dropped and they could export what you know because Myanmar is extraordinarily wealthy it has yeah. all of the natural resources you can imagine beautiful resources yeah. yes and the people are the if you know the people are clever there's not it's not as if they can't do anything they know how to do all this stuff um, it's just the access to opportunity and and so all all of you know, incitement of all of these small groups and warlords and everything else, this is all external. This is not being internally organized. Uh, and, and yes, uh, the, obviously the people that are in there, that uh, they want stability. This is clear. Everybody wants stability. I mean, the, the vast majority of people want stability. And what that's the one thing that they've never really been able to have. So now they got it for a couple of years because what happened? The external the external enforcers stopped providing weapons. So everybody stopped fighting. Uh, now, as soon as they as soon as they had that problem with the Rohingya, that was a different geopolitical problem. It was. That, and it, and it, it was it was very interesting that it was the big the the Western standard bearer that was then required to defend this in The Hague, you know, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi when she was there. That, but right. so this, we can set that one apart. But the, yeah, yeah. the this, but this, that's what, but that's what did her in, you see, because the minute that the minute that she supported the central government's decision to not kind of just let the Rohingya do whatever they want, it had to be some kind of controlled settlement in some way. Um, the Western governments just dumped her. You know, Oxford Uni said they're going to withdraw her, her membership. And I know it was it was it was very embarrassing. But the the, right. the internal struggle then still within this Burmese elites, right? That that one then 
like tipped again to the other side and the, and the military actually it's the when you when you talk about the sen, uh, the, the central government it's basically the military that is just taking over again and it runs a lot i mean in this sense myanmar is the way that things are organized in the state is more akin to a, a smaller version of Egypt, where like a lot of economic things also run straight through the military. Yeah, yeah that's true. That's true. Uh, uh, yeah, and I mean that was that's that's been true in all of, of Asia really for you know quite a while. I mean Indonesia, you know, for the longest time was like that. Um, yeah, I mean it's the only way they can get it done. Uh, it's very, very difficult to 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 keep those things operating without the military. But you know, it, you one always needs to remember that you know there's no government in the world that doesn't have control of the military. And if they don't have control of the military, then the military controls the government. I mean, yeah. that's yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. it's one or the other. <laughs> it's one or the other. Uh, uh, and so Myanmar has virtually never had the opportunity to be free of foreign interference. And yeah. the only time that it was free of like you know, from foreign interference in any real sense was, yeah, during that last, when, you know, when basically Europe and the United States said, hey, we're going to, we're going to open up and let you, you know, let you uh, profit for a while, as long as you have this sort of introduce some democratic, democratic reforms. Um, okay, fine. But, uh, <clears throat> but then the West just dumped on, uh, on uh, Anyan Suu Kyi, uh, the minute the Rohingya thing started to happen. Um and look, I, I, to be honest with you, I, I really don't know exactly what kicked that off at the very, very beginning, and that probably deserves some attention to have a look at that, the causality of that. Um, but but there is no doubt that uh, Myanmar's instability is a cause of external problems, not internal problems. The internal, because it settled down immediately if they were able to export, and if there was no no foreign, uh, no external forces operating and providing weapons to to rebels. Or, or to warlords, everything calmed down very, very quickly. I think that's very obvious, uh, and it will, and it will again, right? It will again for sure. Uh, so, but that's there's three big players, right? It's India, China, India, China, the U.S. and Europe to sort of gather the West, and ASEAN is kind of like you know a balancing. So there's four. So you really have four, three are re three are three are regional, and one is external. So the Western is external. So I would suggest to you that the triangulation of ASEAN, India, and China would be very secure and that Myanmar would come back into the fold of ASEAN very, very quickly if uh, if the Western powers were, were to leave it alone. It's pretty clear that, that ASEAN wants Myanmar um, back and stable as soon as possible. They're working well, on that. They're really working on that. And they didn't, they didn't kick them out. They just paused it, but they made a very important decision, which is like, you are still part of us, and they still yeah, set up right. the the chair for the for that's Myanmar right. at all of their external negotiations. Yeah, because it was Indonesia that inherited the problem, right? And um, and then uh, then Cambodia, yeah. And so yeah, Cambodia said, okay, we'll just do this P do this P five thing, and yeah. um, okay, so that's kind of sit that that framework's still working. Yeah. Uh, and and I think Hun Sen and the Thais and the Malaysians are very 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 busy right now trying to structure a deal that that can enable this sort of um, uh, get, allow Thailand to find a way where nobody loses face, let's say, uh, to be able to close down these corridors for drugs and guns. And when every every time I hear about this drugs and guns things, it makes me think of the Iran Contra deal. Uh, well, Do you know what I mean. I know what you mean, and okay, if we are nearing the one hour mark, and I uh, we need to wrap it up. But this is something that we're going to keep an eye on. And everybody, you just heard it. This is the kind of type of analysis and big geopolitical analysis that you can get from Dr. Dick B. Wren. Um, they can, people can follow you on, on your different sub stacks. You have yep. uh, at least two big ones and, and other yep. ones. You, you have put my name into Google, and you'll find me. Dr. Dick B. Wren, find him on Substack. Um, yeah. Everybody, I, I encourage you to to follow his writings. It comes straight Thank to you. your inbox through um, Substack. Uh, yeah. Anything else people need to know? Well, they need to know that Multipolar Peace is a, a group that we're both we're, we're both in, and that our our friends and other academics and colleagues are in, and we invite everybody to come and join that group. Uh, and if you want to know anything about neutrality studies, you're with the right guy already, Pascal Lotez. Thank you very, very much. It's a pleasure to be able to do this with you. Uh, and I suppose I'm going to host you uh, very soon. I'll be very future. happy to do that. Dick D. Thank you very much. Way.
Mm. Thank you very much.